Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the online services for the Cordova Church of Christ. My name is Kyle, and it's great to be seen by you today. As we begin, I want to wish every mother out there a happy Mother's Day. Whether you're biologically, emotionally, or spiritually a mom to somebody, we want to say thank you uh, for all that you do. You make our world a better place to live. You make us better people, and you are wonderful. So thank you very much. We hope you have a calm, peaceful, wonderful day today. If this is your first time uh, being with us uh, online, I just want to walk you through the flow of today's service. We're going to begin with a shepherd's prayer. Following that shepherd's prayer, we're going to move into a, a candle lighting ceremony that we do every Mother's Day. Following that, we're gonna, I'm going to bring you an encouraging word. And then after that, we've got a, a special message from moms to moms. And after that, we're going to have communion, and then we'll end with a blessing. So with that, I turn it over to our shepherd for our shepherd's prayer. Let's pray. Good morning, Father. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. And we're just so grateful to be able to talk to you um, well, basically, whenever we want to. We're so grateful that you are there and that you're always with us and that we just want you to know that we take such comfort in that. Father, we're, we ask you please to be with our mothers today. We ask you to bless every single one in our fam church family. We ask you, Father, to um, help them to feel loved and appreciated by us. And we ask you, Father, to help those of us that are showing appreciation to heap on a little extra dose of that today. We ask you, Father, to be with those in our family that are, that are sick and um, are having some health issues. We're extremely grateful at this time to hear that uh, Bill is now uh, home from the hospital after nearly three weeks being there. And we're so grateful that his tests are coming back, um, uh, showing um, healthy results. Um, we ask you, Father, uh, to help him as he continues this journey um, to, uh, to, so that he can get his uh, blockage completely removed, uh, help there to be no cancer whatsoever involved. And we ask you, Father, to, to give him strength and, uh, and to uh, uh, be with uh, him and Janice as they go through this time. We ask you, Father, to... Um, be with others in our church family um, that are also dealing with health issues. Um, be with Durant Williams as um, he is adapting to his new kidney transplant. We ask you please to help that to continue to be successful and we ask you to be with the Kennedys as they uh, care for him and watch over him during this time. Father, we ask you to also be with our country um, as we're going through um, a trying time of quarantine. Um, Father, during this time, our economy is virtually shutting down. And we ask you, Father, to, to help it to be restored quickly when we are able to all get back to work. We ask you, Father, also to be with our leaders who are making decisions about when to open things up. And we ask you, Father, to help them to uh, keep safety in mind and to, to uh, watch out for the health of all of those uh, the, our members of our, of our country and society. We ask you please to keep um, those at risk uh, safe and to please help uh, a vaccine to be available soon. We're so grateful to be able to um, have a minister like Kyle who uh, is so flexible and adaptable that he does, um, he can just shift gears and uh, do a sermon through video. Um, we ask you to continue to bless him and to help him as he presents our lesson today. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a lot of joy associated with Mother's Day, but there's also a lot of sorrow. This day reminds us of the people who are not here with us to celebrate. It reminds us of our mothers who are gone, either in body or in mind. 
It reminds us of our children that we lost too soon. And for some of us, it reminds us of the sting of not having children of our own. And if today is a hard day for you, if today has a little bit of sorrow, or a lot of sorrow, as a church we want to tell you that we see you and we love you. Even though we are apart, we are together. And every year, we light this candle. And this candle represents our moms who are gone, our children who are gone, and our children who may never be. And so after I light this candle, we're gonna take a moment of silence, and then I will offer up a prayer. And after that prayer, we'll sing one song together. Let us pray. To the God who sees the widow and the orphan and holds them in his loving arms, we pray. We pray for our friends, our family, and for people that we don't even know who are hurting on this day, who will go through today grieving their loved ones. We pray that you will be especially present with them, that you will give them a spirit of comfort as they grieve. You will hold them. We pray that you will remind us of them, that we will reach out to them in love and support. May we know that we are not alone. May your love be before them, behind them, above them, within them. Surround us all, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. In Thee, O Lord, we put our trust. In Thee, O Lord, we put our trust. In Okay, let's talk about Jesus. This morning, 
As we think about Mother's Day and mothers in quarantine land, we're going to spend some time in the book of Zephaniah. And I want to give you one verse to encourage you to, throughout this week, and really in, the, in all the days ahead, right? And that verse is simply Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 17. The Lord your God is in your midst. He is a warrior who can deliver. He takes great delight in you. He renews you by his love. He sings for joy over you. Now, on the surface, this is a really pretty verse, right? It makes you feel good. You, you don't have to think too much about it to be like, oh, I feel pretty good about myself. Uh, the, the line, he sings for joy over you, makes me think about my wife, Erin, and how at night, after Isaac goes to bed, about five minutes later, he'll run out and he'll ask for songs, and then Erin will go and she will sing over him. He never asked me to sing, but he always asks her, and she sounds beautiful, and, and it just it, those moments really fill my heart with joy. But I don't want to just look at this verse on a surface level. Like, it, it's a pretty verse in and of itself. Uh, I want to actually show you how this verse fits into the story of Zephaniah. Because when you see the movement that leads us to Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, this very pretty passage becomes this magnificent, enriching work of art with, with flavor and nuance. It, just, it fills your soul even more. And I, I want to acknowledge that Zephaniah is a weird book to be in on Mother's Day. Then again, quarantine is a weird place to be on Mother's Day. So I think it'll all work out. Just, just stay with me. All right, so Zephaniah is a minor prophet in the Hebrew Bible. It, it might not be a book that you're really all that familiar with. In, in fact, you might not even be sure if you can spell Zephaniah. Now, I'll give you a minute. Try it. Try spelling Zephaniah. I'll wait. Okay, did you get it? Yeah? You think you, you think you spelled it properly? Did you start with a Z? Yeah? Good. All right. You are, you are on the right track if you started with a Z. Did you then go Z-E-P-H-E-N-I-A-H? Yeah? You did? Well, that was wrong. It's actually Z-E-P-H-A-N-I-A-H. So don't worry, it was your first time spelling it. I'm sure you can get it later. Just keep practicing at home, read through the book, you'll figure it out. So Zephaniah prophesied during the reign of King Josiah, who was king over the southern kingdom. Uh, now, just a quick history lesson so that we're all on the same page. So think back to the Exodus story, okay? Uh, the, the thing we, we, we we, we celebrate, at least at Easter time, when we watch the Ten Commandments movie. Okay, so the Exodus. They're Hebrew people. They're in slavery in Egypt. God comes to them. He brings them out of Egyptian slavery. And, the, uh, you know, long story short, they make it into the Promised Land. So then another long story short, eventually the Hebrew people uh, form a nation. It's called the Nation of Israel. Uh, and they get a king. So, so they have kings now. So the third king that they get is a guy named King Solomon. He's the son of King David. You've heard of David, hopefully. He's the guy who killed Goliath. So that guy becomes a king. He has a son. His name is Solomon. You following? Perfect. King Solomon is supposed to be the wisest man ever. But even wise people make foolish choices. And because of some choices that Solomon makes, uh, the kingdom is going to split when his son, King Rehoboam, becomes king. So Rehoboam becomes king, and the kingdom splits into two kingdoms. You have the northern kingdom, which is called Israel, and then you have the southern kingdom, which is called Judah. Okay, so Judah, as a kingdom, you know, like all nations and really all people, they have their up moments and their down moments when it comes to keeping covenant with God. One of their up moments, when they're, you know, they start to kind of get back on track, uh, happens under King Josiah. King Josiah brings in some revival and some reform. He removes idols and really starts turning the people's hearts back to God. Unfortunately, as is so often the case, this king who started off well ends up letting his pride take over and his story kind of has a tragic ending. And so, so this is the time when all that's happening. This is when Zephaniah is prophesying and, and he's bringing a warning to the people. And so, so Zephaniah is 
warning, it, it starts in a very dark place. Uh, Zephaniah chapter 1 begins, um, I will destroy everything from the face of the earth, says the Lord. I will destroy people and animals. I will destroy the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea. The idolatrous images of these creatures will be destroyed along with evil people. I will remove humanity from the face of the earth, says the Lord. All right, so some of you are already probably making this connection to Mother's Day, right? You might be having a flashback of a time that maybe you broke something in the house or you broke a rule or you talked back and you made a really foolish choice and your mom went all Old Testament on you. Uh, I, for instance, am reminded, was reminded this week uh, of a time, I think I was in second grade, I was collecting baseball cards is why I remember this, and we went to Walmart and mom said, stay in this one place, I need to go do one thing. I don't know that I was in second grade, maybe I was older. Anyway, anyway, stay here, I'm going here, I'll be back in two seconds. Well, I stayed there for like half of a second, and then I went and did whatever, and I got lost. And so mom comes back two seconds later, she can't find me, she's worried, I'm lost, I'm worried, and eventually she finds me. And y you know how like in movies when parents who lose children are like really thrilled and so happy to see their children, that was not really the feeling mother was expressing that day. She was more, um, what's the word, furious, uh, wrathful? Yeah, so she saw me and she just had that mom look that my world is about to end and the wrath of mom is about to fall on the person of Kyle and lo, it did so that day. So maybe you have a similar experience with your moms because you don't cross moms. But that's actually not why we're in Zephaniah. So, so anyway, back to the story. So, so the prophet begins with this proclamation that the face of the earth is going to be you know, wiped clean, that everything will be removed, uh, animals on the ground, fish in the sea, birds in the sky, idols that have been made in those images. Those are going to be dealt with, destroyed with evil people. Human beings are going to go away. It's like Zephaniah is, is, is echoing Genesis 1, but in reverse. In Genesis 1, where you have this like empty space, this, this shapeless space, and God, God gives shape to the emptiness, and he fills, fills the void uh, with animals and fish and birds and, and human beings. And then now in Zephaniah, all that's going to be reversed, and all of that's going to be taken away, and that which was filled will be emptied. And you ask, why, why is God doing this? Uh, he, he hints at it in, in, this, in this passage with the, the idolatrous image and the evil people. And, and he'll explain that on through chapter 1, that the people of Judah have given their hearts over to other gods and to other images and other idols. They have broken their covenant, which is a type of promise. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about the importance of covenants on, on the Sapcast this week. But they have broken their promise with God. And they've, they've worshipped other beings. Now, uh, before we move on, I think it's important to remember that Zephaniah is giving them a warning. And this isn't the first warning. Uh, this is, you know, the multiple, after multiple warnings, after hundreds of years, after numerous prophets God, that God sent saying, Come back, turn around, you're going towards destruction. You know, I think it is really important to remember that God didn't wake up on the wrong side of the bed one morning and say, Zephaniah, I've got some things I need you to tell people. You know, that's, that's not who God is. And sometimes we can, we can be fooled into thinking that the God of the Old Testament is this, like, mean, vindictive, angry God, and the God of the New Testament is this, like, loving hippie who has no problems with anyone ever. They're the same God. And what God is doing here is trying to set the world right. That the Zephaniah is born out of a divine sense of justice and a divine sense of love. That the world is not right. And God wants to put it right. God wants to make creation the best that it can be. Because God loves the world and all who dwell in it. We'll come back to that. So, so this great calamity is coming to Judah. Uh, and, and, and Zephaniah will spend all of chapter 1 kind of talking through that. And he'll, he'll move into chapter 2. And in chapter 2, um, he, he kind of ex 
expands this theme of destruction to not just be towards Judah, but also to all the other nations around Judah, all of their enemies, the, the people who have corrupted uh, the people of God, the people who have tormented the people of God, those enemy nations, they are also going to be dealt with. And Zephaniah's audience wouldn't be surprised by this. Like, like God says, I will defend my people, and, and, and whoever curses you, I'm going to curse them back. Like, I've got your back, Judah. That's not surprising that God would stand against enemy nations. But what is surprising in chapter 2 is how the city of God, Jerusalem, is, is lumped into this, this group of people as well. That, that the place where the temple is, the very heartbeat of, 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 of Judah, it's also going to be destroyed. Listen to what Zephaniah says about why Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. He says, Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing till the morning. Jerusalem had stopped listening to God's call. They'd stopped listening to their very heartbeat. They had turned their backs. They had broken covenant. They had given themselves over to idolatry. And, and there's something terrible that happens in idolatry is that when humans give themselves over to other forces that are not God, it corrupts us. It twists us. When God's people turn their eyes off of God and to something else, it poisons us. And, and we stop being the true human beings that God made us to be, that God is calling us to be. Instead, when humans give themselves over to idols, we become like the beasts, wild craven animals. Like, did you hear the, the imageries there of, of the leadership? They're like roaring lions. They're like evening wolves who come in the night. Idolatry makes us devourers, consumers, consumers of ourselves, devourers of each other. Zephaniah sees a world that's broken and corrupted and poisoned. But the wonderful thing about Zephaniah is that it doesn't end in doom and gloom. And that brings us into chapter 3. You see, it's in this last section where the Lord provides another twist. Like, twist one was Jerusalem is going to be considered like, like other pagan nations. And, and twist two, if you will, is, is actually what God's true goal in all of this is. He's not looking to bring destruction. He's not looking to end existence. Instead, what he's looking to do is to bring purification and to restore existence to what it is meant to be good and loving, not corrupt or greedy or abusive. And he's going to clean the hearts of his people and change our desires to be more in line with what it means to be truly human and to be good. And so, for instance, in Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 9 through 10, he says, For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. Those pagan nations... They will be rescued and redeemed. Their hearts will be turned back to God because they, he, they have been made in God's image because they're human beings. And God wants to rescue all peoples, redeem all peoples. And that's the compassion of God. He's, he's, he's meant to rescue his creation because he loves his creation. And his compassion doesn't, doesn't just go to the other nations. He's not like, well, Jerusalem, you had your shot. Now I'm, I'm I found a new people group. No, no, no. His compassion extends to Jerusalem because he's faithful to his covenant. And so he, he says later on in chapter 3, he talks about how there's, there's reason to rejoice in Zion and, and, and judgment will be taken away and, and there will be singing. And, and this is where we come in that beautiful picture of restoration. This is where we come to chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord your God is in your midst. 
He is a warrior who can deliver. He takes great delight in you. He renews you by his love. He shouts for joy over you. That shouts for joy. That's singing over you. Zephaniah is proclaiming good news to Judah. That the movement of his prophecy is that God's not done yet. That there is a coming day where there will be rescue. And not only rescue, God himself will be among his people in their midst. And and as they are singing praises to him and celebrating their redemption and their rescue, God himself will be singing over them and celebrating with them. It's like Zephaniah is telling them that there is this human and divine party that is about to happen because God, who is the maker of covenants, not the breaker of covenants, because God will fulfill all of his promises as creator, sustainer, and redeemer. And so when we look at Zephaniah, there's, there's the movement it, it happens within this tension of justice and love and where those two intermingle and, and overlap because they both exist together. They are two sides of the same coin. They are two sides of the same God because God pursues justice. God wants to make the world right. God wants to take down abusers and oppressors and greediness. And he wants to lift up the broken and bring healing to the hurting. And he does this because he loves his creation. He doesn't just let sin come into the world and have its way with his people and his creation. That's not who God is. He is a warrior who fights for us. This, this story that Zephaniah is telling us, it's the gospel. It's the idea that the enemies of God can be rescued and redeemed, that sinners can be brought into peace and and can be forgiven. And all that Zephaniah prophesies and looks for, all of that is fulfilled in Jesus who stands with us, who walks with us, who is in our midst, who celebrates over us even as we celebrate Him. But again, the question asks, why are we in Zephaniah on Mother's Day? And it's great. This is a great story. What does that have to do with momming? Well, I've got two ideas for you. First, as I just stated, The movement of Zephaniah is found in that tension between justice and love and how those two things interconnect. Is that not what parenthood, is that not what mothering is? Is is living in that tension between justice and love? Do we not, do, 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 do moms not care about their children living in a right world? Because they love them, right? Like you don't mess with a mama bear. You don't go after her cubs. As a mama bear will rip your arm off, and then that mama bear will take that arm and beat you with it because she doesn't want to just beat you back. She wants to embarrass you. Moms will fight for their kids every step of the way because they love their kids. Just as God fights for his people every step of the way because he loves us. And moms want, want their children to, to, to act rightly. They don't just want their children to grow up to be humans who, who turn into wild beasts, because I know that being a beast leads to a destruction. Like, nobody has a child. And, and it says, I want this person to become a psychopath. I want this person to bring misery to other people's lives. At least... Nobody healthy. No, moms want their children to be good. And in love, we don't let our children just roam around and devour whatever they wish and however they wish. We rein them in by love through it all because that's what God does for us. And even if there are unhealthy moms, and, and yeah, like some of us had unhealthy moms. But even that, God redeems. Even that, God rescues. Even those children. 
because God cares for us all. And so that's, that's one thing that I want you to think about when it comes to moms and when it comes to Zephaniah, is that motherhood lives in that tension between justice and love. And you know what? And this is kind of the second part. That's a hard tension to live in. <laughs> that that is a that it can be backbreaking to live into that tension. And some days it might feel like we we're failing in that tension. But I want you to remember, and this is really the thing, the second point from Zephaniah. That as God was faithful to Judah and rescued the people, and as God will rescue all of the nations, how much more will God be faithful to us? You know, quarantine land is like a type of exile. And quarantine land has knocked some of us down, and we might not feel like we're doing well. And some of us, uh, some of our moms, maybe you don't feel like you're momming very well. And maybe you feel like you started off good, but then it's just kind of, you don't know that you, how long you can keep going or if you can keep going. And some of us started off bad, and maybe we got better as time went on, but we're also not sure how long we can keep this up. And maybe we're tired, and we're worn. And, and what Zephaniah reminds us is that God will bring us through this, friends. That God was faithful to Judah, even when they sinned against him, even when they broke covenant for hundreds of years. God called to them to bring them back. And, and even after exile, which wasn't destruction, but discipline, even after that, God is still faithful to his people. So how much more will, be, will he be faithful to his people who are suffering, who are struggling in our own exile, in our quarantine that is not of our making? How much more will he stand up for us and stand with us. God is not a God who stands at a distance and lets the distraction keep him his attention over there. He's not sitting in a chair flipping through a People magazine while we suffer in the mud. No, God is a fighter. God is a warrior who conquers for his people, who celebrates and sings over his people as mothers sing over their children. This we can be assured of because of the resurrection of Jesus. How much more will God be faithful to those of us who are suffering in a quarantine, in an exile, that is not of our making? And so moms, when you feel like you've hit your limit this week and in the days to come, may you remember that God is fighting for you. He will sing over you. When your kids or your husband just doesn't seem to appreciate all that you are doing, remember that God is fighting for you. He will sing over you. When, when the schoolwork and your own work pile up to where they become too much on both ends, remember that God is fighting for you. He will sing over you. When you feel overwhelmed by uncertainty, when you feel overwhelmed by loneliness or feelings of inadequacy or every other struggle that you are going to experience or have experienced in quarantine land, remember that God is fighting for you. He will sing over you. God is fighting for all of us. He will sing over us because He is faithful. So I invite you, moms, to take a breath. You are alive. God is with you. We will make it through this quarantine. God is fighting for us. He will sing over us. And so, my friends, be safe, be healthy. You are a blessing. And now we have a special messages. We have three special messages from three moms who are here to give encouragement, mom to mom. Hi everyone. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms and stepmoms out there. We love and miss you and wish we could celebrate you in person today. So I was asked what I'm most excited for about being a new mom. And you know, ever since I can remember, I've dreamed of being a mother. And looking back, I believe this desire came from my own close relationship with my mom, but also being surrounded by a family full of wonderful mothers. 
just from pregnancy alone i've learned that motherhood is not for the weak of heart and i haven't even met the little guy yet but with each day that passes i'm excited to live out my dream of being a mom i'm excited to have somebody that finds comfort in my presence someone that i know better than anyone else i'm excited to teach him alongside his dad to have a relationship with jesus and to love others as he is loved i'm excited not only to hold my son for the first time in my arms but also for all the possibilities that his life brings and finally i'm so excited to share him with all of you once they can meet again a verse that encourages me is isaiah 40 11. it says he will tend to his flock like a shepherd he will gather the lambs in his arms he will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. This verse has reminded me countless times that when I feel like I'm carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders, there is one who is greater than I, that if I seek him, he will lighten my load. As a new mom, this verse encourages me more than ever because I'm reassured that God will be with me during anything from delivering during a pandemic to something as ordinary as 3 a.m. feedings. No matter what the burden is, God will lighten the load if we ask for help. Happy Mother's Day again, moms. When I became a mother 16 years ago, I was a full-time school teacher. And the thing that I looked forward to the most about being a mother was the opportunity to teach my own children and especially the opportunity to teach them about God. And so I relied very heavily on the scriptures in Deuteronomy 6, verses four through nine, that say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk alongside the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And these verses were something that I saw my own mother do growing up um, very naturally. We didn't have like an organized Bible study at home or anything like that, but she shared her relationship with God in a very um, natural way, like while we did the dishes and while we ran errands. And so that was my goal too, to do the same thing with my children over the years. And I remember one time when my daughter was about seven years old, Emily, um, and I were sitting talking and I decided to share with her um, an experience that I had that week with God. And it told her that I felt God that week and I felt him early on in the week wanting me to do something very specific. And I told her I prayed about it and waited and um, that I just really felt him continuing to push and continuing to be present in that situation and that eventually I'd followed through and did what I felt like he was asking of me. And when I was done telling her about it, I said, what did you think about that? What are your thoughts? And um, she looked at me and she said very quickly without hesitation, I think next time God wants you to do something and asks you to do something, you should listen the first time. And um, you know, all these times I, I looked forward to being able to teach my children. And the thing that I think I love most about being a mother is that Emily and Madeline and Jonathan, my three kids have taught me far more about God and about faith and about life in general than I think I will ever have time and opportunity to teach them. Good morning, Cordova friends, and happy Mother's Day. We miss you all terribly, and we long for the day when we can worship together again in one place. Kyle asked me to share why I love being a mom. This is a difficult message to convey in just a few moments, but I hope I'll do my best to explain the depths of my thoughts on motherhood. I guess the best place to start is my role models and those women who demonstrated the true meaning of motherhood. Being a mom and a nana is my greatest joy. It's an honor to have been privileged to be, and a true gift, really, to be so many people and, and others in this noble responsibility. I was blessed with a believing mother, and I mean this in every sense of the word. Her belief in God and Jesus, the word, and her belief in her children, both courageously and passionately, she believed. She demonstrated selflessness in her care for her children. 
a strong and talented woman who raised five children, one of which was a special needs child. I had wonderful grandmothers, aunts, and members of the church who taught me well. I have a mother-in-law that came along later in life, and she became my second mom, my own personal Naomi. And God blessed us with a woman from the Woodland Church of Christ who adopted the entire family as her own. I had so many of you at Cordova to help me learn, women older and younger, all of these women that I still admire and still help me along the way. I had the gift to choose what characteristics I wanted to emulate to raise our child based on those examples. Many of you know that we have one living child, Emily. She really did raise us. Uh, she's an exceptional human, an amazing mother, a wife, and a Christian. We had hardships and difficulties having other children. What I didn't know at the time is that God helped us with the one child and gave me many opportunities as an aunt, a friend, a grandmother, to help others raise their children along the way. I have outstanding opportunities now with foster youth that God's placed in my path. For many of you like me, today is where joy and sorrow meets. It hits us head on. We have tears for our own mothers who may not physically be with us anymore. We have sorrows for the children who are not in our arms, but are with Jesus now. We have mothers with whom our relationships are strained. For all of us who find this day difficult, I'm grateful that we have each other. It's a joy that Mother's Day is on Sunday so that we can be together and worship as one, knowing that those deep hurts are brought to the feet of Jesus and we share with our Christian brothers and sisters our sorrows and our joys. We have many fine examples of motherhood throughout the scriptures. Some examples of mothers that I don't wish to emulate, such as Sarah, she's pretty impatient and she takes things into her own hands. I'm sometimes that way too. But the mothers that we really do want to emulate, that I've always wanted to, are exceptional women, such as Moses' mother, Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, Timothy's mother, and his grandmother. But the most notable mother is Mary, the mother of Jesus. God chose Mary, an unwed teenager, to carry and fulfill scripture, but to be held under her heart for nine months, to teach him of his father's house, so that when he was missing at 12, Jesus knew where to go and to be educated and to educate others. And Mary was at the cross with Jesus, just as Jesus' unconditional love held him to the cross, so did Mary's unconditional love hold her to his feet. I can only aspire to take on some of the characteristics of this remarkable woman. A scripture that helps guide me in anything with children is to live constantly the life of a Christian mother. It's Deuteronomy 6, 6-7. And the words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You will teach them diligently to your children, and you will talk of them when you sit in your house, and you buy, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. My favorite joy, as I said, is to nurture and teach my grandchildren right now. As Proverbs 17, 6 explains, grandchildren are the crown of old age. Motherhood takes on many roles for me. It has been my most difficult responsibility, my greatest role, my constant calling, and my best joy. We not only can raise our own children in God's word, we have opportunities to raise others' children and that are placed in our hearts and on our journey here. Motherhood is loving all of them with are the many talents we are blessed with and with the women in our tribe that help us along the way. Thank you for helping me raise mine. God bless you and keep you until we see you again. And now we're going to transition into our communion time. It is a time where, that we have every week where we remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus as we partake of bread and as we drink from the fruit of the vine. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Today's communion thought comes from a different place. One that you wouldn't expect. I, I didn't expect it. But I think it's very applicable. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. It's part of what many of us know as the Great Commission. And in this reflection on the communion, I'd like to read the words from the text. 
Verse number 18 says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What's interesting is as you think about the body that was broken for us, I think of his word, right? Doesn't it say earlier in Matthew that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God? So when you think about the, the, the body that was broken for us, I think about his word. He told us to not only make disciples, not only, not only baptize folks, but also to teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. So as we remember the word, as we remember this, this body that was broken for us on our behalf, it's so critical that we not lose sight that from the very beginning, He wanted his word to be on our hearts, to be on our minds, for us to live by it. When you think about the blood, you think about the, the juice that you may be, be preparing to partake in at this moment in time, that juice represents the blood that was shed for all of us. Discipleship requires blood. That scripture told us that we need to go and make disciples. As you go, make disciples of all nations. It's Christianity isn't difficult. Discipleship is, is, is where you really get deep. Discipleship is where everything changes. Becoming a disciple requires your blood. It requires you to be a student, to be a learner, to be a true follower of Christ. Someone that goes, and it's not comfortable. It's not easy. It doesn't feel good, it, 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 and, and it's not normal. It's not what you see when you look around. It's, it's not common, but it is required. Families, you think about the communion and you think about remembering his body and remembering his blood. The best thing you can do to truly remember is by how you live. Are you pouring his body, true food, into your mind, through your eyes, into your heart, into your soul? Are you, are you striving to live a disciple's life, not just a Christian's? Are you striving to be a student, a follower? You go where, where you're needed. You're attentive, your ears are open, your eyes are open, and, and you're looking to heal. You're looking to bring God's word, God's purpose, God's truth into every situation. And you're looking for it. When I think about the Great Commission, even then, Jesus was still talking about communion. Even as he was about to leave and to rise back up into the heavens, he's still talking to us. 
about how to be in true communion with him. It's about how we live. So remember right now, remember what was done for you. Remember the, the pain and the agony of the cross, his body broken for us, the blood that was shed for us. But the way you remember best, the way you remember most is in your every day. It's in how you live. It's in your life. His word is life. Following him is life. May God bless you as you partake in the communion. As we close our time together, I want to say thank you for, for being with us uh, today online or whenever you're watching this. I want to encourage you, if you are not a part of a small group, uh, to, to get involved in one of our virtual small groups. Um, we are not sure when quarantine is going to end, and we want to make sure that everyone has a community that is, that is encouraging them, uh, that is supporting them throughout all of this. With that, I leave you with this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you on this day and all the days ahead. Christ before us, Christ behind us, Christ be with us.